In the fall of 1984, Haskell Indian Junior College celebrated its centennial. Today, it is the only federally operated liberal arts college for American Indians. But for most of the last century, Haskell was an Indian boarding school, and the boarding school was a major tool used by the government to civilize and ultimately assimilate the American Indian. By the latter part of the 19th century, the Buffalo Road was coming to an end. One by one, the tribes had been pushed onto reservations where the federal government could turn its attention to civilizing them. It was believed that only by separating children from the barbaric influences of their parents and tribes could they be civilized and the Indian problem ultimately solved. As one teacher in the Indian service put it, the Indian problem may be solved by algebra. In fact, it must be solved by elimination, and the Indian is the factor to be eliminated. But how shall the Indian be eliminated? Theories are numerous, but I think most of the shortcuts will fail to give the answer. Civilization. When the answer to this problem has been realized and the Indian has become civilized, the Indian as a race will have passed away. Bud Dupuy and Cordelia Emmett are part of the older generation of Indians who attended boarding schools, sent to the Genoa Indian Industrial School in Nebraska from their home on the Kickapoo Reservation in Kansas. They are returning after almost 60 years to relive old memories. Ready to go. The Indian Reservation to the governmental school where well, they're going to educate me to the white man. school here? In those days, the government had a contract. Uh, they had a treaty to educate us. And when they told me that I was going to school in Nebraska, mm -hmm. I was only five years old, mm -hmm. somehow that terrified me. So the day they came after me, I ran. <laughs> they chased me all over there. Well, they finally caught me and put me on a train. And we came to Genoa, and I'll never forget those days. So you came here in 1920? Mm hmm And when did you go home? 26, 27. And so you stayed here that whole time and never went home? Oh, no, I'd go home in summertime. Oh, would you? Okay. Uh, but no, I stayed. He stayed all the time. From 25 to 32. Uh, I but I went home in the summertime. How old were you? Oh, I was five. I was just a little. I was five. Really, baby. Did you all want to come here, or we had no? Choice. Well, we had no choice, actually. They just loaded they us just up and there we go. You see, these kids come in here on the train and couldn't speak a bit of English. And you just wondered how in the world they ever were going to get along. You were telling me about when you were in the hospital. Mm -hmm. Do you remember that? Yeah. I came in, uh, went in the hospital in November. Snow, snow, snow. And I didn't get out until 
I think it was, well, the tulips were in bloom when I went back to the building. What was, what was the matter? I had double pneumonia. She had pneumonia. They didn't have penicillin and all the antibiotics they got now. But they used to put me, they'd make just like a gown or something, and it would be made out of cotton that was that thick. And every time I'd sweat, they'd change it. So I was really hard on their cotton bat. <laughs> but I got over it. But I sure was sick a long time. Oh, you said they called your parents and told uh, them? They called my parents and said, they told my parents if they wanted to see me alive, they better get up here. And they came up. And just the minute they came up, I got better. From the beginning, Europeans saw Christianity as an absolute necessity in their efforts to civilize the American Indian. Zealous missionaries at the vanguard of the advancing frontier established schools to, as one Methodist missionary put it, teach the Indians to live as white people. Originating in colonial times, schools such as the Shawnee Methodist Mission established a pattern which the federal government later followed. Such schools were designed to be self-contained institutions islands of civilization in the moral and physical wilderness of the frontier. The schools were located at a distance from Indian communities, and the children were educated in a totally controlled environment, apart from any contaminating influence from their savage parents. What the people who started these schools felt about the native traditional religious practices was that they were heathen and pagan, and that uh, the children were going to have to be converted to Christianity. Indeed, you couldn't go to school unless you agreed to be converted to Christianity. A lady that I Elizabeth Parent, an Athabascan, is chairman of the area, Department of American Indian Studies at San Francisco school. State University. So she has studied the impact of mission schools on said, native children. It's time for school to start. The children were kind of put into a total submersion in uh, the Anglo, the I, what I call, um, well, it's a quote from um, a man named Burkhofer. It's called the ideal of Anglo conformity. The ideal of Anglo conformity. You have an Anglo name. You have uh, a Christian religion. You have Western European dress, no matter how cold or hot it is outside. Uh, and you live in a nuclear family, away from all these disorganized extended families. The children also had to be scrubbed, a lot of baths. Uh, they had to discard their native dress. They had to have haircuts and a lot of shampooing. And I think part of all this washing that these Christians kept doing, a lot of ba bathing and scrubbing and good strong soap and hair cutting and all that was kind of in a way maybe led to a negative self-image. That um, And even there are even religious traditions who told Indian children that if they really prayed hard enough, they'd get white. But the uh, imposition of the um, Anglo lifestyle upon the people was really quite total in this area. And if the people didn't like it, they simply could not have schools for their children. Efforts to civilize the Indian remained solely under missionary control until 1819, when Congress began subsidizing mission schools. As a result, these remained the dominant type of Indian school until the 1880s. And although no longer funded by the government, mission schools are still to be found in Indian country today. In the latter quarter of the 19th century, however, the federal government began to replace mission schools. Renard Strickland is Dean of the School of Law at Southern Illinois University. Of Osage and Cherokee ancestry, Strickland is an authority on Indian law and history. Uh, the federal government came into uh, the educational process primarily after the American Civil War. 
uh, it, uh, I think, came into the process because by that time the government had fiercely determined uh, that uh, the end of the uh, old Indian way uh, was at hand. If you read the literature of the period, it is full of statements like, uh, we want to Americanize the American Indian. Uh, we want to, quote, uh, destroy the Indian and save the man. In 1879, Captain Richard H. Pratt founded the first federal off-reservation boarding school in Carlisle, Pennsylvania. The success of Carlisle Indian School led to the founding of many others. And by the turn of the century, 25 off-reservation boarding schools were in operation. These schools were organized on a military model. What sort of clothes did you wear when you were here? Uniform. Uniform. Blue <laughs> denim uniform. <laughs> I was five years old when I got here on a Wednesday when I was dipping my head in the kerosene deodorant. <laughs> and uh, that same Sunday, I was out here with a military uniform and a little military cap. Marching. With the band. With the band playing. They had good bands in. Did they? Oh, yeah, they had a they had real good school band. Did you all play in the band? I did. I marched to. Yeah. Under the Devil Eagle. Philip, Philip Sousa's <laughs> March. <laughs> Superintendent was an old southerner, Sam B. Davis, and he believed in discipline, and this was his way of disciplining the children. And we we became uh, pretty good drillers. People from town used to come out and watch us drill yeah, on a Sunday afternoon. On a Sunday afternoon, the whole campus would be surrounded by cars, and my they did it when my mother was up there too. She used to make her so mad. She said. She heard somebody say, uh, uh, Uncle Sam strained monkeys, <laughs> and she never did forget about it. She, uh, Turner and Nora Cochran attended Haskell Institute in Lawrence, Kansas during the 1920s. But we had a real fine drill. Uh, it was a dress parade, and uh, then after that was the social hour. You could, you could go across that, that road that separated the men's side from the women's side and invite your girl to come and walk around the campus for about an hour. And sometimes they'd have either cake or uh, some kind of a little refreshment. But that hour was what they called the social hour. And it was around where that bandstand is now, circling the, circling the campus. Stop, you to no, walk you couldn't walk. You couldn't go sit down or you had to keep walking and chaperones on both sides watching. <laughs> could, you, could you tell me again um, sort of a typical day that you went through at school? Well, it was all done by bugle calls. And uh, you hear the uh, reveille early in the morning. Had to get up and stand the reveille and uh, have roll call. And then you went out and, and drill for about 30 or 40 minutes. A little bit later, they had uh, 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 formation, bugle call, to, stand formation to march to the dining room. You went to the dining room and eight men on one side of the dining room and the girls on the other. And then you'd have school call and you had to form and go to school. Then in the evening, retreat was the main uh, bugle call that you heard and you had to stand and, and they took down the flag. Well, after you took down the flag, you, you were off a while, and then you marched to, to the uh, dining room for supper. Then you had to stand in formation at 8 o'clock to march to uh, study hour. And then you went to bed. All the lights were out when taps blew at 9. But they had a night watchman that came around at midnight and took a bed check so, to see if there's anybody missing. What happened if somebody missed bed check? What, what would well, that do to you? There was, you got so many demerits. And if you had demerits, you couldn't go to town on Boys Town Day. Boys Town Day was one Saturday, and the Girls Town Day was the next Saturday. What sort of things would the, would the girls do when they went to town? 
Oh, you'd buy combs or, you know, little knickknacks, powder, and all that stuff, try to be beautiful <laughs> in the uniform, a baggy uniform we had. <laughs> The military regimentation was enforced by severe discipline, to which the children were unaccustomed. This, combined with the loneliness and despair caused by the lengthy separation from their homes and families, led many children to run away. Ray Tosuda, superintendent of the Riverside Indian School in Anadarko, Oklahoma, tells of his father's experiences. Dad didn't didn't want to go to school. He's one of those kind didn't want to go to school either. And uh, they put a they put a woman's dress on him to keep him from running off, keep him from going home. And some of them even put they even put uh, a ball uh, and chain, you know, put a shackle on her ankle and had a maybe a big old uh, steel ball and actually have to carry it out. Uh, this was the old old you know boarding school. You ran away, didn't you, bud? When you oh, yes. yes. We always, tried to we always ran away, but we always uh, got caught because we were too young. Did, did you run away? No, I never did try. I never did try to run away. The girls weren't so... And they weren't as No, much. they didn't do that as much. I never ever really actually heard of a girl running away. Bernice ran away. I never did. I just never even thought about it. They didn't let the girls go anywhere. We were really restricted. They just made tell us a line, you don't go past that walk, you don't go past that walk, you stay on this side. If they catch you out of bounds, you got punished. But what, besides military discipline, was taught at the off-reservation boarding schools? Instruction in the lower grades? consisted of the three R's. The language of instruction was English, and children were disciplined for speaking their native language. For the older students, the school day was divided between academic and manual or industrial training, with the overriding emphasis on the latter. This was designed to provide the Indian student with a craft, farming, carpentry, printing, blacksmithing or harness making for the boys, homemaking, nursing, or teacher training for the girls. Armed with such practical skills, graduates were expected to become productive citizens who would be quickly assimilated into the American mainstream. Furthermore, these schools had the added benefit from the government's perspective of being largely self-sufficient. Most of the tools, clothing, and food needed for both the students and the staff were produced by the students themselves. After we graduated, after we got through the fifth grade, they were teaching us a trade. We were brought here to, uh, to study blacksmithing uh, under Mr. Bernstein. How old were you when you came here? Twelve, twelve years old. And as young uh, students, we were here we each had our own forge. We had an instructor who taught, taught us how to make horseshoes, how to weld, how to repair uh, wagon tongues, how to make wagon braces for them. How did you choose to learn the trade of horseshoe? They lined us up and they took so many that uh, to come here to, to be blacksmiths, so many to be bakers, so many to be carpenters. And uh, uh, it wasn't uh, uh, a choice. We had no choice. We were just told this is where we'd go. We'd go to school in the morning, and in the afternoons we'd be here making horseshoes. Mr. Cochran, you were saying there was something called an outing. That outing, yeah. Well, a lot of the girls went to Kansas City. Uh, I don't I know what, you never did go? Well, I know that was the older girls. Oh, figured she was out too young. How to do it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there, a lot of the girls went to Kansas City. A, a lot of them that I knew went there uh, in the summertime, and some of them went to the same people, 
two and three years uh, because working. they knew them they'd work in the homes as domestics and you know mm -hmm. take care of kids and uh, and they'd take them on uh, vacation trips because they had kids to take care of and uh, they'd learn learn how to uh, set tables and and serve dinners and uh, uh, have parties and stuff, uh, they figured that that was a learning experience. Did you go home in the summertime? I didn't. What did, what did you do? I stayed there for four years. And never went home for four Never years. went home. Until I graduated. Why Until didn't you go started. home? Uh, we could, I could, they couldn't afford it. So your family could, had to pay your transportation to and from school? No, I, the government paid it. Oh, I see. They paid it once. They paid it uh, two, and then when I graduated, they paid my way back home. Why did you come to Haskell? Well, they were hoping I'd get an education. <laughs> I to learn something. <laughs> but why Haskell as opposed to someplace else? Well, most of them were coming to Haskell at the time. There was over 100 tribes <clears throat> from about 30, 35 states. It was I, like one big family. Chippewa and Navajo, you were just friends with everybody. And even it didn't today, make any difference. when we go to an alumni association reunion, like say in Albuquerque or Oklahoma City, uh, it's like a bunch of kin folks grab and hug and kiss and, <laughs> and just tickle to death to see one another. Boarding schools created a sense of Indianness that went beyond tribalness. Uh, if you look across the country and you find hyphenated Indians, young men and women who are Seminole and Sioux, uh, or Kwakiutl and Hopi, more often than not you'll find that their parents met uh, at an Indian boarding uh, school. So the boarding school was a point at which uh, Indians from a great number of tribes came together and began to understand each other's culture, and from which emerged, I think, a national sense of, uh, of being an Indian and what being an Indian uh, was about. Hey, well, we don't be stars before this is over. It ain't our fault. I'm never sorry that I came and was here. We spent happy days here. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Good times, I remember. A lot of people, a lot of acquaintances. We had a closeness because of, of the, uh, probably, we were so young, but New we years, formed, uh, formed an affection that lasted all, all our lives. When you thought that I knew nothing, when you brought me here to just another empty Indian, just America's first fool. But now I can tell you stories that are burnt and dried and old, but in the shadow of their telling walks the thunder. interviewed a number of, of elderly Indian people who went to boarding schools in the 20s mm -hmm. and almost invariably they they have uh, very very positive things to say about that they have a very positive memory of that. Do you think there's any particular reason why they would have such a strong sense of, of positive feelings toward that? Well, they're the survivors they're obviously the ones because they're here in 1985 they're the ones who weren't destroyed by the by the process I'd like to see, to see if there are people beneath any number of gravestones who, whose lives were broken by the process, uh, who could not fit in anywhere, who turned to drink, who turned to uh, uh, other self-destructive behavior. Uh, you know, I wish there were a sample of those to talk to, to interview also. Alfonso Ortiz, 
to boarding school. Ateba from San Juan Pueblo is professor of anthropology at the University of New Mexico and one of the most prominent anthropologists in America. So you you went to a boarding school when you were young? Well, yes, yeah, seventh grade. Uh, that time, there was uh, the old Santa Fe Indian School. Uh, in Santa Fe, New Mexico, and uh, most Pueblo people went either to Santa Fe or the Albuquerque boarding school, depending on how far away you know they were, vis-a-vis -vis each one. I went to Santa Fe because it was just 30 miles down the road south of where I was born and raised. But uh, there was still impressive regimentation then in the very early 50s because I was constantly being put on, they called it extra duty or special assignment as, uh, oh, punishment for fighting with my roommates, uh, taking a bar of soap that I wasn't supposed to have, and things like that, uh, that, that really, really, from a contemporary point of view, would be regarded as quite silly. They would take those reasons to put you in, uh, in special duty. Or they had something called the Board of Education. It hung in a corner of the uh, advisor's <laughs> office. It was about four feet long. When you went in there, when they prescribed the Board of Education as punishment, the advisor would just, the boy's advisor would just say, bend over, boy, you know, and give you as many whacks as he thought appropriate for the uh, infraction. Uh -huh. yeah. And this special duty, uh, it's not just a cute little euphemism. It meant usually shoveling snow at uh, 6 in the morning before anyone else had to get up. It meant things like, uh, washing latrines after school. It meant things like uh, having to skip a meal, which for a 13, 14 year old is one of the most painful things you can ask them to do, you know, when you're still growing. Uh -huh. Yeah. So why uh, did you go there to begin with? Well, there was no, no real uh, uh, poverty, really, because my grandmother couldn't uh, afford to support by herself. She was by herself now. She'd raised my two sisters and me. She really couldn't afford to feed me three meals a day while living at home. But when she saw what a, uh, what a bad deal I was getting, given the spirited kid I was, uh, she, we, made, we made do, we just made ends meet somehow. Mm -hmm. uh, what was a typical day uh, when you weren't being uh, given special duty? Well, the bell rang at, uh, <coughs> I think 7 or 7.15 at the shower uh, and march over to the um, campus mess, you know, have breakfast. It's really usually, uh, or more often than not, uh, oatmeal with, with, with things crawling around in it, maggots and stuff. Uh, it was a real turnoff. Uh, or powdered eggs that were so salty that you were thirsty the rest of the day. It, you know, there was no meal that was uh, really very good. Matter of fact, I thought uh, that for a while there that uh, all Santa Fe chickens consisted of uh, necks and wings because that's all we got. When we had fried chicken, we had necks and wings. Presumably the uh, administrators and teachers kept the uh, best parts for themselves. Were most of the administrators and teachers Indian or non-Indian? At that time, non-Indian. It's the lower workers, the uh, attend dormitory attendants, the people who actually slung the hash, so to speak, and the maids were the Indians. Uh -huh. Did you interact much with them? Or? No, no. They had their own little compound, and the dormitories were at opposite ends of the of the campus. What was the curriculum like? That's the interesting part, because uh, there, the bureau was still imbued with the notion in those days that uh, Indians had no business aspiring to college. So there was very little college prep in the curriculum. There was about a third of the day was taken up in, uh, in, in uh, uh, manual arts. You know, uh, farming, baking, silversmithing, weaving, uh, manual arts in any case. But it was, pre it was pretty much uh, assimilationist, uh, right down the line. Almost every subject was uh, The American way is good, you know. It's the only way there is for you, and the sooner you shape up, the better off you'll be. That was a consistent line from every vantage point, from every classroom that you got. 
there's cer it's certainly no secret that that you know assimilation was the old, was the was the reason boarding schools were established to begin with, and, and at least through the 1950s was the major. If but not. you see, it's it's that line that could be counteracted by gentle uh, grandparents, in my case, who by example showed that that was not the only way of life there was on this earth. You know. A telling perspective on the boarding school experience is offered in a painting by Gray Coho, the Navajo artist. It is called Tosita Waits for the Boarding School Bus. In it, a small Navajo boy stands beside his grandmother. The colors suggest discord. The extended anatomical proportions of both the grandmother and the child reveal the anxiety and tension of a child being pulled away from a place he knows and understands very well. The grandmother knows that once the child has gone away to the boarding school, he will never be quite the same again. The price that is paid for this is a great one. She is willing, reluctant though she may be, to pay the price because she can sense that her grandchild's survival in a changing and alien world may depend on it. At the bottom of the painting is a witch figure, a cat with a sparkle in its eye, which says much about the educational process, that it involves a kind of cultural transformation, a magic, and there is some blackness in it. There are people who led productive lives there who might not have if they stayed on the reservations completely without any formal education at all, but I think in taking them so far away and keeping them forcibly away from their parents, you know, and forcibly really acculturating and assimilating them. It uh, also created some people who were no damn good in either life, you know. They weren't good Indians because they've been away so long and they, because they were dark-skinned, could not be accepted in polite middle-class white society. I mean, they were, so they wound up, for the most part, by my experience, they wound up going home and eventually learning how to be recently how to fit in again after a year, long years hiatus back on the reservations. There is no single boarding school story. There's the story of the uh, Indian who is taken uh, to a very distant uh, place, doesn't come back for three or four years. The Indian in a boarding school, uh, like the Albuquerque boarding school in the 40s, uh, where there was a director who believed very strongly in uh, Indians speaking their language and working in their own culture and moving from that culture into the white culture. There's the Indian who was at Chilaco, uh at a time when uh, Indians were being beaten and handcuffed uh, if they in fact spoke uh, their own uh, language. So the Indian boarding school story uh, like any uh, story about uh, individuals, uh, is, is, a diverse, is a diverse one. The boarding school story remains equally diverse today. Reforms made in the 1970s eliminated many of the more serious abuses, such as corporal punishment. And the growing number of Native Americans filling administrative and teaching positions at these schools has brought a gradually increasing awareness of the need not to destroy but to foster in students a strong sense of their Indian heritage and identity. Furthermore, long overdue changes in curriculum and services that recognize and speak to the specific needs of Indian students have been instituted at several of the schools. Currently an instructor at Haskell Indian Junior College, Ed Nessifer, previously taught at Intermountain and Phoenix Indian boarding schools. Can you sort of uh, make a general statement as to what the value of boarding schools are in the overall scheme of Indian education? Well, I think, the, first of all, it maintains um, the Indian culture. Right now, it builds it up with the interaction with different tribes and people. It gives a lot of students a chance where they won't have it in public schools, where they won't be discriminated against. Um, uh, a chance to complete school, and uh, I think those are the, and they have a chance for good education.
Riverside Indian School is one of six federal off-reservation boarding schools. It is the only one housing both elementary and high school students. Do you like, do you like public schools? Not really. How come? I don't know. I, it, my mom said when I, when, I, when I was growing up, my mom wanted me to come to Indian schools where I can learn more about them. About Indians? Yeah. Are you, are you learning about Indians here? Mm -hmm. Are there special uh, curricula, um, uh, special elements of your curriculum designed for Indian heritage or no, something like that? No, no, uh, there isn't. Uh, I think a lot of that is just, uh, a lot of it is just built in. It's just uh, uh, built into uh, the, the curriculum. For instance, Oklahoma history. Uh, here again, I guess you might say that we're, we may be a little biased uh, as far as Oklahoma history is concerned because uh, we teach a lot of uh, Indian history in Oklahoma history because to us it, uh, it is Oklahoma history. <laughs> so we tie it all in and uh, I guess you'd say we do put emphasis on it. The kinds of kids who are likely to go there are those who wouldn't be in any high school at all, who wouldn't be going to college at all if they didn't have this all Indian high school. For the simple reason that they've encountered so much discrimination and so many things that turn them off from uh, public schools, you know, in their areas, that they simply would drop out if they couldn't go there. Huh? Where'd you come Oklahoma from? Oklahoma City. Did you come in the middle of the school year? Yeah. I didn't want, I didn't like the public schools at all. Why not? To me, no. Because they um, were too strict down there at the public schools. It's, they give you more room here. <laughs> you were mentioning that you have them 24 hours a day. Are, are there some educational benefits to having them all that time? Yeah, I, I think they uh, they do learn uh, a certain amount of uh, structured living here. If they stay with us, they have to. I guess our our philosophy here is to try to teach them some of these uh, 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 basic or survival type of uh, tools that they need. You know, to after they leave here. Charles Jibo is the vice president of Haskell Indian Junior College. He has held top administrative positions in both public schools and Indian boarding schools. Is it fair to say that most students that end up at boarding schools um, bring problems with oh, them? Oh, absolutely, absolutely. You see, the off-reservation boarding school in, in the early days was uh, was really there because there were no other schools available. Okay. Now <clears throat> that there are more schools available, uh, the off-reservation boarding school has become an alternative school. Uh, alternative uh, for al students with, uh, you know, that need to be dealt with for, uh, you know, behavior problems, you know, that they, uh, you know, needed some alternative ways of dealing with them. Uh, also alternative learning styles. Uh, a variety of things. We came here to Haskell and that was in 1951. Ken Kadu attended the Haskell Institute in the 1950s. Recently he returned and to Haskell to pursue a college time, education. The, uh, physical layout was, it was it was quite a much quite a bit different than it is now. We had a we had a, a much different uh, uh, different attitude uh, in the instructors in the teachers they, they were they were more paternalistic or they were still pretty paternalistic back in those days. Uh, today uh, at school we have more um, Indian teachers and they have a much uh, you know much more um, up-to-date uh, attitude in their teaching. Of course a lot of them being Indian uh, naturally they would uh, you know they would uh, have a better attitude and a better um, way of presenting uh, their, their uh, teachings or their subjects to the uh, students. 
and it's a lot better relationship. We have a more um, outspoken uh, young Indian people, especially in college. Uh, I guess that's that's a part of the difference too. But I think it uh, overall there's just a greater awareness um, uh, in the students, uh, which was uh, not there, you know, when I was a young student. This is not to say that the schools today are without problems. Many old problems and some new ones remain, such as the loneliness and misery students often continue to feel upon leaving the lands and families that have borne and nurtured them. We had one little boy that, oh, we were making a lot of progress with him, and he was smart, too, boy. I mean, he was going by leaps and bounds. <clears throat> but he didn't come back last year. Is that a problem that a lot of children suffer from homesickness and loneliness? Yeah, it is. It is. This really is one of the things that hurts us about as much as anything, you know, in losing our kids is just plain old homesickness. A long time ago, I didn't like it here, so I tried to get kicked out by going AWOL and doing bad things, but it didn't help. They didn't, uh -uh. They didn't kick you out, is it? Uh -uh. They said it didn't matter what I did wrong, I was still wouldn't I stay here still. So I just quit all that. What did you do when you went AWOL? Just roamed around by myself. So what do you do on Saturday night? Just like a regular nights, walk around and you know talk to people. It's pretty, you know, it's pretty boring around here. You know, you stay here a while. You first get here, it's all right. You know, first week, you stay dead when you stay here a while. So you get pretty lonely. Yeah, miss your parents and stuff. But I'm used to that since I've been away from it for you know seven years. Do you have problems with the kids going into town and, and going a wall or whatever? Yeah, we do. It, it isn't a real big problem, but it is a problem, uh, uh, yes, uh, especially the older kids. Uh, you know, you take a kid uh, 16 or 17 or 18, and since it's only a mile to town, they can't understand why they just can't, uh, after school, you know, run downtown. And uh, uh, they just, they're adventuresome, and, and they just like to do it. Despite very real and profound difficulties, the off-reservation boarding schools today serve purposes far more humane and compelling than those for which they were created. Therefore, many of the students who attend them have taken an intense, active interest in shaping them and feel that they have a strong stake in keeping them alive. Thus, it is ironic that now, when the potential exists for the schools to truly serve Indian peoples, the government is narrowing its trust responsibility to exclude education. In 1978, the Bureau of Indian Affairs operated 15 off-reservation boarding schools. Since then, nine of these schools have been closed, including Shalako, Concho, and Fort Sill in Oklahoma, Mount Edgecombe in Alaska, Stewart in Nevada, and Intermountain in Utah. The remaining six off-reservation boarding schools, scattered widely throughout the western states, serve less than 3,000 students. The opportunities for us to uh, teach the, I guess, the uh, importance of um, uh, being Indian uh, is with us. We have that opportunity now. It's an opportunity that uh, our students uh, today need. Uh, they need to be aware of who they are, of where they come from, uh, and you know, and, the, and those those kinds of things that will make them. Uh, proud of who they are and where they come from. And we should be working to, um, you know, to make, uh, I guess, to retain uh, the boarding schools, to keep the boarding schools that we, uh, that we still have, because the government has been going through the routine of, uh, you know, closing down boarding schools and, and uh, all kinds of Indian schools. The federal government took on in a series of both treaties and acts uh, an obligation, indeed a responsibility, to assist uh, Indian people in exchange for surrendering their traditional uh, lands and portions of their culture uh, in order to adjust to a new way of life. Uh, the task of assisting Indians in uh, functioning in a very different uh, society. So there is both a long-term legal uh, as well as a moral 
uh, obligation with regard to the educational process in the Native American. Part of the thing is the Bureau feels that, that uh, education is not a trust responsibility. Uh, non, you know, uh, minerals, coal, cattle, trees, land, those are trust responsibilities. But education is not really a trust responsibility. And they vacillated on that. Sometimes some administration said, yeah, it is a, a trust responsibility, and so they all, you know, support it, and others they say they don't. How do you feel about that? Well, I think there is a, I think there is a responsibility there. Uh, you know, and I think that there is uh, a responsibility to provide an education uh, for, you know, for students that uh, either do not have, you know, are not able to get an education because the schools are not available or because the schools are not providing services to those schools, uh, to those students. And I think the Bureau has a responsibility for that. And, uh, uh, and I think that they should, should live up to that. John Edwards is an educational specialist for the Anadarko, Oklahoma Area Office of the Bureau of Indian Affairs. Uh, what kind of future do boarding, off-reservation boarding schools face, do well, you think? It's my personal feeling, and I spend a total of 35 years in the Bureau of Indian Affairs from the first grade on as an employee now. And there has been tremendous changes in the philosophy of the Bureau of Indian Affairs towards education. And I think eventually that that will, uh, that will eliminate most of the boarding schools that we now have. So you think that within at some point in the future that the, that the Bureau will get out of the education business altogether? I, I see it coming, and I see it coming fast. On January 27th of this year, a group of determined Indian students began a 24-mile run in frigid weather conditions in northern Utah. They were running to protest the closure of Intermountain Indian Boarding School in Brigham City, Utah. The students ran from Brigham City to the federal building in Ogden, Utah, carrying petitions of support with over 12,000 signatures including that of Utah Governor Scott Matheson. The petitions were to be delivered to Utah's congressional delegation in hopes that they would be able to put pressure on the Bureau to keep Intermountain open. The protests failed to save Intermountain. Charles Jeepo was the school superintendent when it closed in 1984. Why did it close? Well, I think, you know, there's, uh, there's a certain amount of politics, you know, uh, that, that gets involved, uh, either directly or indirectly. But regardless of that, some of the reasons that they gave uh, for, you know, closing the school was the fact that, uh, uh, you know, it was uh, economically, it was very expensive to operate. Uh, but it was a large facility. They had about 1.5 million square feet of floor space. Uh, it was like a 320-acre campus. Uh, each dormitory that we operated, and we operated around 16 dormitories, uh, would hold about 50 students total. Uh, that's not very cost-effective, you know, when, when you look at a dormitory operation. But it is effective in terms of the kind of population you deal with. You don't want to have 150 to 250 students in a dorm, because really what those students need are individual attention. A lot of the students come came from schools that were they were uh, in the public school, and there would be only one Indian student, and there would be a lot of pressure on them. Or they were kicked out of various other schools for various reasons. Or they uh, school school was an alternative for the jail. Or it was either jail or the school. So a lot of people, different students, were coming to that school. Mostly students who had been kicked out. Uh, they had some interesting programs there. Uh, in addition to the academic program and uh, also quite an extensive uh, dormitory program, uh, they also uh, had a mental health program. They had a complete mental health staff in the clinic there, which no other school had. I mean, where you had a couple of psychologists and social workers and whatnot. Uh, we also operated a solo parent program there. and. Uh, 
These are young girls, single, who became pregnant and had a child. We had like 30 girls uh, there and 30 babies and had our own daycare center on campus. And uh, the girls, just like they were, you know, working, they would, morning before class, would take their children down to the daycare center, go to class, and be back there by 4 o'clock. And uh, I think that, you know, those were our best groups of students. They were the ones that had the highest completion rate. Uh, what happened to the students uh, after well, was, the school was yeah, closed? I think a lot of those students dropped out. You know, they, they went through a lot of effort to try and identify schools where these students could go. Uh, I think, uh, I don't think that a lot of the students, they really kind of lost them. There was a lot of talk that this, the Utah delegation uh, in Congress and and the house said that all the programs in Vermont would be transferred to Phoenix. Well, I was going, I went down to Phoenix, and all the students said that they were going to have a place in Phoenix. None of the programs were changed there, none of them. The solo parent program went to Riverside, and nothing happened. And the same thing happened to Phoenix. So they said a lot of things, but nothing was replaced. That, all those programs were no longer there. Student Council President Gail Nakwa spoke to the crowd. Congressman Hansen says, send us back home. Does he mean back to the schools we've already been unsuccessful at? Or back to the environment where troubled youth could not receive the help they needed? Yes, Congressman, that might save the government some money in the short term. But what about years on welfare or unemployment that comes from an uneducated, unemployable citizen? What is the education of a person worth? What is the value of the human soul worth? I know that they want to do away with boarding schools. I know the budget is, is, uh, is having, you know, the United States budget is having serious problems. We have a big deficit and all that. But I feel like that uh, these kids really need help. If I didn't see it and know it, I wouldn't say that. I would say, okay, let's gracefully do away with the boarding schools, but I can't say that. I feel like uh, boarding schools are needed probably more now than when I was going to school. If we were to have this conversation 10 years from now, how many boarding schools do you think would be left? I think the only boarding schools that will be left probably in 10 years will be on the reservations. Like Navajo and places like, like that? Navajo. And uh, I think probably those boarding schools will no longer be regular BIA boarding school, but contract schools. The BIA has recently begun contracting with Indian tribes and organizations to run some off-reservation boarding schools. One of these is the Santa Fe Indian School. The Santa Fe Indian School now is wonderful. It's, the superintendent is an, is an Indian, Santa Clara Pueblo Tewa Indian. Many of the teachers are Indian. Some of the other key administrators are Indian. Uh, it's, a, it's a wholly revolutionized, responsive curriculum. I'm not saying it's all good, but it uh, depends. So much depends on whether it's something the people want and the people themselves can control. Whether it's their institution. So this is contracted and run by the All Indian Pueblo Council. So it's an Indian contract. It's, school. it's an Indian contract school. Uh huh. So it's it's a very positive force in Indian education. Ken Kadu helped found and has served on the Board of Education of the Kickapoo Nation School, an Indian contract school established in 1981. I think the boarding school and the uh, Indian or tribally owned or tribally operated uh, school has much more importance now than it uh, did in the past. And I think it, it, we have, as Indian people, have the opportunity to make education uh, much more meaningful uh, to the Indian student. Uh, because in the, when my mother went to school, and before her, her, uh, her mother, uh, the idea was to you know, take the, the children away from the uh, environment, away from the traditions, and, and away from the, uh, the cultural things. Uh, and, that, and that happened. But still, the, the culture and, and the traditions they maintained, our, our people uh, 
on the Kickapoo Reservation, they still do those things. They still participate in ceremonies. They're still a very spiritually strong people. And uh, it should make people realize that the idea of um, you know, taking that away from the people is something that can't be done. The great value of schools that are operated by tribes or for tribes uh, is that uh, it's what American education was built upon, and that is uh, a school in a community responsive to the felt needs of the leadership of that uh, uh, particular uh, community. Now, I think it would be a mistake to just target boarding schools for closure. Better to ask them, are they serving the community and are they uh, accepted by the community, by their constituencies? And if, if they are, there's no, absolutely no sound reason for closing them. We are here to ask you to carefully and thoughtfully reconsider your position on the Intermountain School. We ask you to make this decision with our faces and our eyes and your mind. We ask you to balance the needs of the Indian youth Again, <laughs> against the ambitions of space and military. Within the wind, a winter wind, another wind is moving. Children whose great-grandfathers prayed for guns, wait on playgrounds at Concho and Shilako, watching the sky. Aun hus, maxia, o o itjue. The rhythm of guns in their eyes. <laughs>